The process statement is invaluable. It allows us to execute sequences of events and thus to have memory elements in VHDL. So we will start discussing one of the most useful, important and confusing parts of VHDL, the process statement. The process statement is invaluable, not just because it allows us to use syntax that is very useful. We'll find that there's a lot of syntax that we use in test benches that cannot be used without using the process statement. But it's also very useful because without it, we wouldn't be able to have storage. So having memory or storage in VHDL is contingent upon having the process statement and process blocks. So there's a few things that can be really confusing about how processes are simulated and how they are synthesized. I'll try to clarify some of these. So uh, the process is actually a block of code. It starts with the process keyword. Uh, it could have a label before it or not, usually because we, in a normal design, we have a lot of processes. We don't label most of them, but the process keyword indicates that we have started a new process and it ends with the end process keywords and What's, whatever in between is the process itself. There's also a begin keyword that comes at some point after the process keyword, which gives us an indication that there is a declarations part of the process that lies between the process keyword and the begin keyword, and there's a body for the process. We will later learn that the declarations part of the process is where we declare variables that are local to the process, but now we have to focus on the body of the process. So the main thing, the first thing we have to understand about processes is that they make statements within them execute in sequence. So when we started to look at VHDL, we, uh, un we, one of the first things we understood about it is that it is a concurrent language because it is describing hardware connections, port mappings, and so on. It has to be concurrent. It really doesn't matter in which uh, order you state the mapping of ports or the connection of signals because it just is parallel. Everything happens in parallel and that's the nature of hardware. However, we need to have an exception to this and the exception happens within processes. So statements within a process are executed se sequentially in serial. And the main reason we need to have this exception is because we need sequential circuits. So the main use of processes we, we will see is to declare latches and registers and memories. So that's the main reason. You cannot have storage without having sequential uh, execution of statements. And sequential execution of statements doesn't happen by default in VHDL. So you need a, a, an exception. And so the process statement says that everything within the body is exempted from concurrent or parallel execution. And so if you look at this uh, piece of code where we have a uh, very simple process that consists of three statements, these three statements are exchanging the values uh, in the locations A and B. Um, at this point, we really don't know what A and B are. Are they latches or re registers? We don't know yet. But there are values in locations A and B, and this code will actually exchange the values between A and B because it is executed in sequence, or at least it should, you know, so it should execute like C code and it should give us um, the, uh, the value of A going to B and the value of B going to A. But there's a question about processes and that is usually where some of the confusion comes from. And the question is, when is the process actually executed? Because when you have concurrent statements, we don't have to ask this question because these statements indicate connections or uh, signal processing that always happens. It just indicates hardware. And so we don't actually need to ask, when does this hardware execute? But in a process, you need to ask when it is executed because it's a sequence of instructions. And so what happens is, when the simulation first starts, any process that you write will execute at least once. So this process will execute once when the, simu when the simulation starts. What happens when, it, when we reach the end of the process? Do we execute it again? 
Do we execute it again conditionally? Do we never execute it ever again? So in this video, we will look at one way in which we can control how often a process is executed, which is our sensitivity lists. In the next video, we will look at a more rigorous way to control flow within a process, which is the wait statement. So here we have a process with a sensitivity list. The sensitivity list is a list of signals that lie in the uh, parentheses after the uh, process statement. So this is the sensitivity list. It could contain uh, multiple signals, and we will see many circuits where the sensitivity list contains multiple signals, but it could contain uh, only one signal. So what, this is, what is the sensitivity list? The sensitivity list is a list of signals which uh, sensitize the process. This means these are signals that cause the process to execute. When do they cause the process to execute? Whenever they change. And that word is important. What do we mean by change? Because that's an important question. So what, what's going to happen here in this process is that it's going to execute once at the beginning of operation. And when, when it reaches the end, it's going to go back and it's going to look at the sensitivity list. It's not going to execute again, but it's going to execute again only when a change happens on a signal that is in the sensitivity list. So if R0 changes, then the process will execute again and will wait again for R0 to change. So let's trace, for example, uh, what's going to happen in this process if, uh, for some reason, R0 is caused to change through some external means every 100 nanoseconds. So we see here that R0 is changing from 0 to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's counting up every 100 uh, nanoseconds. So probably it's the output of a counter. So what's going to happen in this process? What kind of uh, hardware does it implement? What kind of behavior do we see? So when R0 changes from 0 to 1, the process is sensitized and it executes. So we go through the process and R1 takes the value of R0, R2 takes the value of R1, and R3 takes the value of R2. And so at the end of the process, we will see these values for R1, R2, and R3. So R1 is going to have the value 1 because R1 took the value of R0. R2 is going to have the value of R1, but we see R2 taking the value 0 here, which is very weird. R3 is going to take the value of R2, which is 0. That's fine. So let's take another step. When R0 changes from 1 to 2, the process is sensitized again. And R1 takes the value of R0, which is 2. R2 takes the value of R1, but it doesn't take this value, R2. I mean, are we executing a sequence or are we not? Why is it taking 1, the old value of R1? If we go deeper, we see that, for example, when R0 changes from 4 to 5, the uh, R1 will take the value of R0, but R2 will take the old value of R1, and R3 will take the old value of R2. So why is this happening? This is happening because we need to distinguish between two things that happen to signals within a process. Transactions and events. So what's a transaction and what's an event? An event is easier to understand. An event is an actual change in the value of the signal. When the value of the signal changes in the register, on the wire, wherever it is, that's an event. So it's a real life change in the value of the signal. A transaction is just a scheduling of a change. It means that we intend to change the value of this signal. So whenever you meet a signal assignment within a process, that causes a transaction. It doesn't cause an event. It causes a transaction. So the value of the signal doesn't actually change. There's only a transaction which is stored somewhere that we have the intention to change the value of this signal. When does the transaction turn into an event? At the end of the process. For now, let's just say at the end of the process. And so if we go back here and let's just trace what's happening. When R0 changes from 4 to 5, the process is sensitized. R1 takes the value of R0. 
what does this mean? Does this mean that R1 has become R0? No, it means that there is a transaction for R1 to take the value 5. So R1 is still equal to 4 at this point. It's only intended to become 5. There's a, a transaction for it to become 5. And so when we say that R2 is equal to R1, R2 will have a transaction. So this is a list of transactions to take the value of R1. But what's the value of R1? It's 4. So it's going to take the value of 4. Why? Because R1 hasn't changed yet. Now, when we say R3 is equal to R2, we have a transaction for R3 to take the value of R2. But R2 hasn't become 4 yet. R2 is still 3. So R3 is scheduled to take the value of 3, which is the current value of R2. These three transactions will become events when we reach the end of the process. And so at the end of the process, R1 takes the value 5, which is the new value that we uh, had transacted for it. R2 takes the value 4, which is the new value I transacted for it. And R3 takes the value 3, which is the new value we have transacted for it. And then at the end of the process, all three transactions become events. And there is an actual change in the value of the signals. So how much time does transactions take? Like how much time did this going through the process take? And how much time does updating transactions to events take? It takes zero time. It takes a nominal delay, which is a delay that takes place within the simulator. It doesn't take any real delay. So this is just an artifact of the simulator, but it is necessary. I mean, when we look deeper at the difference between transactions and events, we will find that even though it can be a little a little bit confusing, it's the only way you can actually have registers and latches. Because if you look at what's happening in this table, for example, you will see that the, you are kind of actually approaching a shift register. This is what's happening here. So without having a distinction between transactions and events, it's impossible to have registers and latches. So let's just take a look at what would happen if this sensitivity list was fully populated. And let's just talk a little bit about what fully populated sensitivity list means. When we look at this piece of code in the body of the process, there are three signals which are independent variables used as assignments uh, in some statements. So for example, R0 is something that is assigned to something else. R1 is 2 and R2 is 2. So a fully populated sensitivity list for now is a sensitivity list that includes all signals which are used to the right of any assignment. So let's just assume that we have the same process except that the sensitivity list this time includes R0, R1, and R2. And we have the same body of the process, so the same you know, three statements. Let's, let's trace what's happening in this case. And let's also assume that R0 changes uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, every 100 nanoseconds. So when Z, uh, R0 changes from 0 to 1, this causes the sensitivity, sensitivity list to be sensitized and the process to execute. So we will assign the value of R0 to R1 as a transaction. And so uh, R1 will take the value 1. Uh, R2 will take the value of R1, which is the old value, which is 0. And R3 will take the value of R2, which is the old value, which is 0. And so at the end, we should see 1, 0, 0, just like the table above. Except that was, what has happened here is that ha there has been an event on signal R1. Signal R1 has seen an actual change at the end of the process. And so the process is called again with zero delay. It's all called again immediately. And we have to do this again at 100 nanoseconds. There hasn't been any time. This is an event that happened on R1. And so the process is called again. And so because R1 has changed, we execute the process again. And R1 takes the value of R0, which is still 1. R2 takes the value of R1, which is 1. <clears throat> and R3 takes the value of R2, which is still 0. So by the end of this, we will find that um, the value of R2 will update to 1, 
whereas the value of R3 remains at zero. But then this would indicate that there has been a new event on R2 and the sensitivity list is activated again. And we call the process again and execute it again. There's no change on R0, so there's no change on R1, so there's no change on R2, but R2 has a new value, one. And so R3 is assigned this new value and we update the value of R3 to, uh, to one. And so the process is actually called three times because there are three signals in the sensitivity list. Whenever one of them changes, the process is called again. And this all happens with zero delay. And so at 100 nanoseconds, everything becomes a one. If you do this tracing again, you will find that this repeats again at uh, 200 nanoseconds and R1 updates to two, R2 updates to two, and R3 updates to two. So everything then becomes the same value. So what, what happened here? What happened here is when we had a full sensitivity list, when we had a fully populated sensitivity list, the code in the body of the process became combinational. This is what actually would happen if we had combinational code, that this, these three statements would be signal connections and they would just cause the three signals to be shorter to each other, which is what's happening here. And so this gives us an idea of how we will use processes. We will use processes in one of two ways. Either the sensitivity list is going to be deficient, like in the first example, or it's going to be complete, as in the second example. And there are valid users for both uh, ways of using a process. A process with a deficient sensitivity list will be used to declare registers. A process with a complete sensitivity list will be used to declare complicated combinational blocks like state machines.